living extraordinary times. How have you been managing as artists during the pandemic? Um, I, yeah, the the um, I mean, it's obviously a strange time. Uh, I I had a studio um, outside of my house, and because of the pandemic, I kind of moved home, uh, my studio home, and kind of cocooned myself in my studio. And I guess um, making the music with Chris, we you know, it was mainly done over Zoom. Uh, and so not Zoom, it was mainly done over, over well, over the airwaves anyway. Um, so in a funny way, it didn't really stop anything happening. Everything continued, but it was just in a more isolated way. And hopefully I've, I've come through it mentally intact. I actually talked with Chris in 2018 about the possibility of a reunion. He was all for it, but he said that the timing was always bad. Uh, from your point of view, what has been happening around sneaker pimps since uh, Bloodsport? Wow, that's so long ago. <laughs> that's that's 2003, wasn't it? Bloodsport. The last two was 2003. It did kind of keep going. There was things we did in 2005, which would be the sneaker five. Some of the songs of which are on the new record, the new album, the new record. Uh, and I think the last time we did anything together song-wise was 2007. And after that, it disappeared. Yeah, we, we have, <laughs> I, I have, I have uh, three folders on my Sneaker Pimps uh, hard drive and it's, I've called them Heritage, uh, which is the, which is the stuff we wrote in 2005. And then I call it the mid period, which is stuff that me and Chris were writing when he was living in Cypress Park in LA. And then the new period, which is what we've written in the last year or so. So there were three kind of spurts of, of energy and, and writing, and then long periods of, of um, abstinence in between. Um, it's and it's just, you know we never we never disbanded. It was always it was always going in the background, uh, and it just it's just unbelievable that it took so long. Um, eighteen years is a long time. Some people are only eighteen years old, so it's you know it, it is it was incredible. To, it was protracted, uh, but it's a fabulous feeling to to have eventually released it. It's it's um yeah it's it's very. Uh, satisfying. Talking about those mysterious three folders, what sparked the newest one, the new period? Um, well, we we thought it wouldn't be right uh, making a new album without having some totally fresh fresh uh, songs on it. So we and we started with um, with the tracks going in the circle, and me and Chris wrote that. Uh, remotely so so we wrote it um me in london chris in in california and we it was a real kind of ping pong game we uh, chris started off with, with a little bit of a verse i then did a bit of verse he did a bit of chorus i did a bit of a chorus uh and we kept just knocking it backwards and forwards and it's the first time we've worked like that but it was, it was kind of exciting in, in a way because it's it's um it, it makes you forces you to uh, think about things in a different way when you're in a room with someone, it's it's very intuitive. But where, when you're working online uh, uh, remotely, um, you have kind of, you know, you have a day to think about what you're going to do, and then the other person has a day to think what they're going to do. And so it's a different dynamic. Uh, I wouldn't say that every record should be merged like that, but it was it was fun to do what we did with like that. On top of the new way of working, there's also almost a decade between Bloodsport and Squaring the Circle. Has all this time changed something in the dynamic or the way you work together? It was, we, we felt like we got back into a, a, a groove, if you like, a, a, a workflow that was, you know, surprisingly unchanged. I think, you know, once we started working together on it uh, after, the, after a big break, it was just like old times. And I think that kind of, um, you know, rebonding and and making making a record between friends is what it's all about. You know, in the end, 
it's it's really the relationship between the people who write the music that's the most important part and it has to be you know music has to be fun you have to do it because you want to do it and and you know there's no you have to wait for the time the timing to be right and and the our various energies to be synchronous i think uh and you know this that was uh, that's exactly what happened we we thankfully found common ground and got on with it and did it I, I really because in the in the modern era because if we think about it when when Liam and Chris send songs and say okay can you play with the lyrics can you do this can you do that uh Blood, uh, becoming X of Splinter, I would be sent audio cassettes, <laughs> which I would have to play and rewind and play and rewind. Uh, and Bloodsport was CDs. And it's much easier from my own point of view to have something be popped through on WhatsApp or email and just go, OK, and you can put it in garage band and loop sections and just go and repeat, repeat. So. From my contribution, it's loads better. And the confinement was perfect because I, I, I couldn't work, so I had nothing else to do. So possibly it's the most productive, it's the most productive Sneaky Pimps has ever been in terms of getting a lot of songs done. Yeah, it was it was hard work. I, I um, uh, because of the time difference between London and LA, uh, I had to kind of reset my clock, so I was staying up till three in the morning for a couple of months, uh, working working on the tracks, so we could so we could have direct uh, responses. Uh, but it was a it was a, quite a slog to to get sixteen tracks done. Um, you know, that's a lot of that's a lot of music. Uh, but we we felt like uh, it was important to put everything out that we'd done, like a, almost like a, a, a musical diary, I think. So that's why it is. 16 tracks it was it felt it felt right to include everything that we that, that um we'd, we put our efforts into and you know this day and age uh, people just choose what they want anyway on spotify so the more the merrier as you said it was a musical diary so what kind of things were you going through at the time i mean what kind of things got put down in that diary and in a broader sense too how do you approach writing lyrics Um, I, th I think we, I mean, it's, I think as a band, Sneaky Bimps, we've always uh, conceptually tried to keep away from uh, regular pop music. And, you know, it's really important for lyrics to actually, I know it sounds old fashioned, but it's really important for lyrics to mean something. Uh, quite often in, in uh, I think especially now in pop music, we're going through a very bleak period of, of incredibly dumb lyrics. So, and, and you know, that's not necessarily the, the fault of the artists. It's more the fault of the audience, unfortunately. And, and I think uh, culturally people aren't really um, connecting to lyrics as much as they used to. And it's a kind of, attention problem and it's a TikTok problem and it's a you know it's the it's it's the world of of um sh quick fixes and i think people listen to the music and, and they kind of get a feeling for it but whether they go back and analyze the lyrics is a different thing so with sneaky films there's an imperative to always tackle something um thematic or uh, in a in a song and and kind of Uh, be, be as poetic as possible within within the context of pop pop lyrics. Uh, Ian can talk about the lyrics a bit more. Uh, yes, uh, I mean the songs that were already that already existed that uh, that people know from sneaker what was what has since been called sneaker four and sneaker five, which were unreleased. Uh, It wasn't a case of arbitrarily saying, oh, well, you know, let's use these ones. We listened and looked back at the lyrics and it was like, well, you know, 
something like So Far Gone, which was originally called The Sun Ate the Moon, uh, it it just had it it had it hadn't lost any of the lyrical impact that we wanted. You know, these things are always true in the same way that someone like Baudelaire will always make sense. Uh, a Shakespeare sonnet will always make sense and have resonance. So there wasn't really any need to do any lyrical updating. Uh, and so with that as a starting point, the lyrics are always... People seem to take all lyrics as a relationship story, as something personal. And we've always been... I don't think it's clever, it's just how we are as writers is that you can take everything on an individual level, but there's an awful lot of uh, social comment that goes in there. Spin Spin Sugar has always been seen as a very sleazy kind of song, but originally that was written as a, it was written as a, as a anti-capitalist rant within the era. It was kind of all about the, a lot of Becoming X in fact was the, the hedonism of the 90s, it was a very hedonistic time. You know, ecstasy had made a huge comeback. Cocaine was becoming a drug of choice for people just to go to the pub on a Wednesday night when they do the pub quiz. So it's always been a bit like that. Uh, and I think obviously at the moment and uh, in the last maybe five years, there's been a growing uh, an important focus on on not just mental illness but mental health and how how the modern world is affecting individual people and increasingly and they are suffering maybe it's the awareness maybe it's what's actually going on with a return to kind of nationalism and populism it's a little bit like we're living the, the 20th century all over again. And coronavirus could be seen as the first world war that everyone had to cope with. And so there was a lot of that influence on almost like a global social psychosis. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I think in, in a way, um, our lyrics have a traditional quality. If you go back to, say, 60s protest songs and and um kind of uh, uh the, the kind of political songs of the, of the 60s early 70s uh where there was a lot of comment on on uh, human nature and and politics i think it's not that we're a political band as such but i i think we're always there to to put a lens on human nature and the human condition and and try and um uh, try and kind of somehow uh it, it sounds too fanciful but uh, to, to somehow kind of make people think or, or to expand thoughts and to uh yeah invite people to to interpret it in, in their own ways but but you know the, the, the most important thing about lyrics is it should make you think whilst you're li listening to the song if it doesn't make you think then you've missed you've missed a trick and I think every song that we've ever written, um, if you listen to the lyrics, uh, you'll have a you'll have a thought, whether it's a good one or a bad one. Uh, but it will, you know, it's it's it should stimulate the brain. Yeah, was, uh, yeah, we couldn't do we couldn't do a Billy Bragg type straightforward or a jam type protest about minor strikes and stuff like that. No, it's much more philosophical. Liam uh, Liam as an artistic background and his work as an artist, the installations was always very philosophical. Chris is an astrophysicist who was always, who didn't really read anything about astrophysics. He always read bizarre French literature, you know? Uh, and phil So there's always a, a more philosophical thing. Yeah, and, and we, you know, we're, it, we're not so I, would, I wouldn't call ourselves intellectuals uh, we're, we're we're readers and thinkers uh, in, in a modern context 
and you know our medium if you like is is still pop music uh, you have to you have to accept the boundaries of pop music uh, it's it's not a thesis it's a pop song <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know but pop but music is music is a perfect place to put poetry to and so there always has to be a beauty and a poetry in the lyrics and and that's often not done in music <clears throat> Uh, but you have to keep within the guidelines, really, of a, of a verse-chorus structure. You have to have the hook. Uh, I think, I, I, I think in that respect, squaring the circle is more accomplished to the format. I don't. I think we deliberately, on becoming X, tried not to have. Too many choruses and yeah. things like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we at the same time as 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 being um, conceptual and a thought, mindful and thoughtful about stuff. You know, it, in the end, it's a it is a pop record, and uh, you know that's the medium we've we've chosen. Uh, so within that context, it's stretching, but. You know, I probably couldn't present it to my philosophy tutor. <laughs> <laughs> Who's probably now dead, so... Uh. <laughs> you mentioned a couple of things like uh, social climate of our time. Was there a theme or a emotional landscape that you followed through these 16 songs? Yeah, I think... Uh, as Ian was saying, there's a kind of mental health perspective, I think, which is uh, certainly something that didn't exist in, in Becoming X or Splinter of Bloodsport. They were much more uh, uh, kind of direct in, in that sense, whereas I think Square in the Circle has it has a, um, a kind of questioning uh, feel about it in terms of your own position in the cosmos and and your your kind of own your your self opinion and self belief and 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 you know your own your own uh, mental health and i think you know certainly we're older now and we've all gone through various tricky moments and 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 you know all of a sudden um those things become much more, much more important to you than than um, than they were before so i think experience uh guides you to an area which is going to always be more um uh, kind of uh it's always going to look more at, at mental health issues and and general you know general well-being and it i think it also the climate of of the you know the, the world kind of climate not climate as in as in uh, weather but the the social climate is you know the, the awareness of mental health is has is thankfully kind of bubbled up and it's now you know it is it is now fine to talk about it and you know 20 years ago it wasn't if we, if we were writing songs about mental health in the 90s we'd have been cancelled <laughs> cancelled yeah so that's a that's a new one yeah <laughs> i think on the album the the most overtly and i might be wrong but i would say the most overtly uh the most overtly I, the, the songs that most overtly address mental health or have that within them at the strongest point it would be sos and fighter yeah I yeah I'd, 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 yeah i'd say those two are yeah and th those are, those are written they were both mid period songs so they were written in Like 2015, I think actually they, they were they were written around that period, um, and it was certainly the period that that me and Chris had a, a bit of a, a um, experience with with uh, mental health. And I think, um, yeah, I, I think it was just yeah, it's it's just very, it's thankfully topical, and and uh, it would be as as spokespeople in a band as lyricists it would be foolish not to include the things that have happened to you and i think you know that's it's important to be authentic 
Yeah. I think then you also, you know, the, there's also the Me Too. You know, the rise of the Me Too had happened. Uh, and I think we got in there, again, like, uh, like Bloodsport was well ahead of its time in the fact that it, it, it had a lot of the best of the 80s musically in mind when, when Liam and Chris approached that album from the, from the writing point of view. Uh, and on Becoming X, well, we, we knew Kelly was going to be doing the singing. And so when Liam very kindly said, would you like to have a go at writing some lyrics for this? We have a chance to record this album and, you know, we, we have a record deal guaranteed if we finish this. Uh, yeah. You had I, to twist it yeah, so, I just, so a girl could sing. Yeah, and I think it was... And be powerful. Yeah, it was like a... I do see Becoming X as, as a feminist record. Um, and in that sense, it was pretty progressive. Yeah. Because yeah. we're, you know, we're not three blokes from a northern town <laughs> in England where misogyny is, is the is on the menu. <laughs> it's the only menu. It is. It is. It's a... So, so I think, yeah. And then, so again, <laughs> returning to uh, having a girl, uh, Simone, who I met... I don't know, maybe eight years ago now, and that's how I, I was working with her through a Lana Del Rey contact, and and we started working on her record, and I thought she'd be great for for Sneaker Films because she has all the kind of criteria for for, for that, and and again when when it has a female uh, when it has a, a, a female singer, it, it flips the meaning, and I think I think it's it, we're very careful to. Right from a, you know, from a, a sympathetic perspective in terms of the the, the, the gender. I, I think it's a, you know, th- I think that's a uh, an interesting kind of approach because I think most people always write, you know, f- uh, from their own gender. But we, you know, we 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 try and kind of uh, include the that that quality in it and, and so it gives it and yeah it, it gives the album an interesting pers- perspective because it's half half it's half girl half boy there's almost like a, and the duets are very interesting because that gives it an, a different dynamic you have you know one verse chris sings one verse simone sings so it's there's almost like a kind of relationship between the two and it's you know i, I think that that uh it definitely kind of increases the interest and the fact that you have three people all caring about the quality of the lyrics means that you means that it, it, it's instantly more objective because we're not the same people we're from the same background but uh, we've all lived very different lives in the interim period coming to square in a circle and so there's instantly more it's instantly less subjective than say uh, where the singer writes the lyrics, and that's why he's the the singer, you know. So I think that's a strength. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's definitely a strength. I think if you look at most bands, the lead singer writes the songs, and uh, no one else really um, contributes. In which case, you get a very uh, singular, a very singular um, uh, meaning to it. And I think with us, we write by some kind of committee and I think that's a strength I think one of the great things about music is that it does allow for committee creativity or or group creativity if you're a painter no one you know it's impossible for two people to paint the same painting but in music it is possible for two people to to write lyrics or it's possible for two or three people to to write the music together and that's why bands are bands that's why you know that's why we have bands and unfortunately I think that format it's kind of on the way out a little bit because modern music uh, bands can't really survive anymore because they can't afford to. So, so yeah, we're, we're we're representing the band in that way, and I think you know, I, I think the the common voice of of a band is an interesting and if dying art. Some of these songs could have already been released in 2005. Do you see the long time span of working on this music more as a boon or a bane? Yeah, I, I think 
Um, I think if we'd bashed it out in 2005, it would be a very different record. Uh, and I mean, certainly from my perspective, I've been working on lots and lots of uh, other bands because my, I guess my day job is a music producer and I, uh, you know, I've helped hundreds of bands make their records since since 2005. Uh, and that's been very informative. I, I love new music and I love helping people form identity and, and make their, you know, make their brands or what you, whatever you want to call it these days. Um, and so I think that's folded back into the way that I work. Uh, and I definitely feel like I've brought something fresh to it over the years out of wisdom um, or certainly experience, if, if not wisdom. But it's yeah, it, it would it would have been a different record back in two thousand five. Songs were written during a long period of time, and some of them remotely. But how would you describe the recording process? We mainly did. Uh, I recorded a lot of Simone, for instance, in London, in, in my studio in London, uh, three or four years back. And then I had a couple of trips out to LA, and Simone came out to LA. So so we we were for a, a month or so all with the three performers we were all in one room in one studio this is just before the pandemic um so we were all in the studio all together at, at one point um in it and that was i think it was essential to have at least some time together yeah that's that's um and also simone is a very competent producer herself uh, so she very capable of recording our vocals and sending them over so so uh, we did it you know we It's a bit of a patchwork quilt of of, um, of of musical bits and pieces that we sewed together for the for the final piece. Going back to the times we are living, do you feel like this pandemic had an effect on squaring the circle? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, it's because I think in a way we tried not to to make it, for it to have an effect um, because. In, in a way, um, the music is, you know, it's kind of an escape, and, it, and it's a, it's a way to travel somewhere else. So I, 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 we certainly didn't write anything direct about the pandemic, and I don't think it affected lyrics as such. Um, but yeah, the, the, the main effect of the pandemic on it is was was physical, practical. Um, But funnily enough, it didn't get in the way. So, you know, if, if anything, as Ian said, there was there was a sense of um, everyone was off at the same time, <laughs> so we could we could figure finish it. Um, uh, yeah, maybe if it wasn't for the pandemic, <laughs> yeah, we still be it, doing it. It wouldn't have come out yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have the uh, pandemic to, to thank, perhaps. It's, uh... This time will surely change music industry. How are you finding releasing new music at the moment when you compare it, for example, to Bloodsport? Well, the music industry has an entirely different shape from what it was at Bloodsport. So, so it's interest, interesting to, uh, you know, to release something then where it was very straightforward in a way, releasing music in, in the 2000s, to a point now where releasing music is a mysterious process and. Um, an extremely difficult process uh, the, the, the politics and the practicalities of digital release um, are you know the, the, are huge and it's a bit of a uh, yeah it, it's a very it's now very complicated and very tough to release new music thankfully we are a band that still has a, a fan base so so we've already got a kind of platform To release music on, and also obviously through Chris's IMX project, um, we have a through our old fans and some new fans. We we have a base to start from. But if you're a band starting up from nothing, um, getting heard is just near impossible um, without social media, um, and, you know, without having a lot of uh, followers and interest and luck. So you know, I I am. Um, I'm thankful that we we didn't have to start from scratch because if we had to start from scratch now, it would it would be a very uphill struggle. I'm not I'm I'm very worried about um, new music and how and how it now finds its way to listeners. I think it's 
it's becoming more corrupt than it's ever been. Um, influencers, for instance, are paid. The uh, major labels quite often give influencers fifty thousand pounds to put their tunes onto TikTok. Is that yeah? Really? Yeah. So, so that's not a that's not a um, level playing field. Uh, so these influencers, who all due respect to influencers, but they're u- usually not the most um, uh, uh, what's the word um, qualified of people to choose music. Um, you know, at least back in at least before the the social media, um, you would hope that the people who who chose music, the gatekeepers, as it were, were um, were at least qualified to you know to choose and 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 to curate but now it's being curated by people who you know who, who sell perfume and people who go, go to the right parties it's people a little go to dubai <laughs> in the middle of a fucking pandemic <laughs> that's what they do <laughs> so, so we're in a little bit of a sorry state uh, um on the flip side of that argument uh you can um you can if you're lucky be a a, a new artist uh, that blows up uh, with new music and do it entirely outside of the music industry and be lucky you know you can have success but it's so it's now that the the um, chances of, of having success are very very slim now and i think we we had a much fairer chance of, of doing well before it's, it's obviously with a live thing as well because you can't play live during that whole period and for any new band coming up you really need that okay social media you can build your audience but there's always there's always a requirement for live music i think a lot more could have been done to keep cultural things open during this whole period i don't think it was so unsafe to organize live events but that seemed to be what suffered at the expense of keeping a shopping mall open. I live in Chris's old hometown, Berlin. And in here it seems that under the guise of the pandemic, clubs are being closed, youth cultural centers made homeless, squads are evicted. Do you see the same kind of gentrification in England or London at the moment? I mean, London's a very rich city. Uh, and I think, un- unlike unlike Berlin, it's 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 much it's less liberal. It has it has fewer um, kind of artists in a way. I mean, the artists, the, the the music industry in London is is still very commercial, and the the majors and the commercial artists always survive, uh, unfortunately. And and that's it's the you know it, it's the more independent people who, who suffer. And I think through the pandemic, the pandemic. Um, Smaller bands are definitely those, you know, the ones who have who've, who have been affected the most. Um, in terms of, in terms of kind of politically, uh, London doesn't really seem to have been changed much. Um, there's, uh, the, you know, house prices are still huge. Um, the rich are still making lots of money. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think it depends where you are. I, I think, I think London is unscathed. Uh, Whereas um, perhaps other places in the UK have suffered more. Let's take a trip down memory lane, if you will, to the year 1994, when Sneaker Pimps was founded. What are kind of the first thoughts that come to mind when you think about the time around forming the band? Uh, that's a yeah. We we were we were working. We all lived up in the northeast in a place near Hartlepool. Um, the three of us, me, me, Chris, and Ian, and we, studio. yeah, we had a studio at my dad's house. Wonderful little studio, yeah, in a bedroom. It was in a bedroom, and we used a cupboard as a vocal booth. <laughs> uh, and it was, I mean, the thing that I probably most remember about it is how much, how funny it was. We we had a lot of, we we would make music all day long. We would go down to the village pub. Um, at ten o'clock, drink several pints, come home, listen to it, get very excited, <laughs> try and change the world. Um, and, and we were young; we were incredibly opinionated. We thought we knew everything, uh, and 
and everything kind of fell into our hands. Where I don't think we were ever quite as thankful. I don't think we knew how lucky we were the way that it unfolded. Um, for instance, when we met Kelly, we, we thought she was great, and within a week we got her up to uh, to Hartlepool, and we recorded all the vocals in two weeks, and that was it, done. Um, and we didn't really think much about it. And then, of course, the record started to do to do really well um, by its own, uh, you know, in its own way. And then we got a deal in in America on Virgin Records, and yeah, it all kind of fell in our laps. And, and looking back, I'm very grateful for it. But at the time, we probably thought we deserved it. <laughs> it it's classic because Liam lived in a in a village outside Harleypool. I was in Harleypool, although I was in Portsmouth doing a journalism course at the time, and Chris is Middlesbrough. So the village atmosphere was very nice. It was always very nice to come up there as a as a as an infant to be away from the small town itself. But I seem to remember that the whole village was very supportive and very behind the whole project. They were all very excited by, you know, Chris has always looked different to everybody else in the Northeast. Yeah. <laughs> he just, he, he's, he just has that. I, I seem to remember everyone being very, yeah, we, we, very, we had a, not thinking we were wonderful, just thinking that we were theirs, if in that makes sense. Yeah, the local pub, it was a, <laughs> a, a bit of a hub. We used to go down there every, every night mm -hmm. and, and yeah, have a laugh with the locals. And but what happened, unfortunately, was as soon as we moved away from the North East, because we, we relocated our studio in London because of practicality as much as anything, um, it's funny how the the the, you, you, the people who loved us turned a bit because they thought that we'd we'd um, abandoned the northeast, and it's it is sad in a way um, that uh, that the UK and uh, and elsewhere is so um, you know it's all based around the capitals now and and I don't come there's a clever word for it but I've forgotten it. Um, and and the provincials uh, and the the smaller towns are getting less and less populated, and everyone's moving to the to the, to the major cities. So it's a shame in one way, but in another, we had to do it. We we uh, you know the, the way that the music industry works is certainly back then you had to be where it was happening. Um, maybe now it's reversing slightly because a lot of people have, uh, don't have to go to work, so they've moved moved out of the cities. So I think perhaps there will be a revival in in more, um, it's rude to say provincial, but uh, in smaller towns. For instance, you know, there used to be real scenes uh, like the Manchester scene or the Sheffield scene, and they don't really exist anymore because everyone moves to London or no one really lives there creatively anymore. So I think because of the pandemic, one of the things that may happen is people move back to the smaller towns and to the to the rural areas, and maybe we'll get scenes again. Maybe we'll get music scenes that aren't, aren't just London. You mentioned how opinionated everybody was back then. So, how much of your music was rebellion at the time? I think I think we were. Uh, I mean, we we tried to kind of throw a bit of punk into our music. I mean, it's whether or not that's. I suppose on tracks like Tesco Suicide, you can hear an yeah, element thinking, of yeah. element of punk. Um, mm. And back then, we would because we were more uh, opinionated and and uh, a, a kind of forthright. I think we we our opinions we we felt uh, like we could throw them at people a lot harder. So Tesco Suicide, funnily enough, on the flip side of mental health, it was it was um, it was a kind of It was a song saying uh, if people are, you know, certain, uh, I don't know, it was, it was kind of on PC <laughs> because because it was talking about selling suicide kits in in, in local supermarkets, um, which is so at, in that sense, um, we've done a full U-turn. Um, but that's, a, that's a, just an example of, of young and slightly kind of overactive minds. 
I think I think we 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 courted controversy back then, and I think as you get older, you controversy just seems less and less attractive. <laughs> yeah, dwelling a bit more in the past, becoming X celebrated its 25th anniversary already. What are your fondest memories around that album? Oh, good. Do you know what? I, I, uh, the bit I'm, well, the moment I remember the most is um, I borrowed my dad's camper van as, as a tour bus and we were rehearsing in uh, some shitty rehearsal studio in London. And I, I was driving, we were all staying in Reading at the time because, because I, had a, I had a house, a flat in Reading, which is just about 40 miles out the west of London. And we were driving back. And we put the, we had the radio on Radio One BBC Radio One, and it was a late night show uh, of and I can't remember whose it it was now, but but a Tesco Suicide came on uh, for the first time ever, and it's the first time I've ever heard, heard our music on the radio, and I remember it being a transcendental moment, thinking I can't believe it, it's actually on the radio, and we've turned it up, and the whole band was in the back of the camper van, and and we turned it up and played it and it felt like felt like everything had arrived all at once and i think that's the that's that kind of you know it's the first it's the first kind of birth of excitement and after that everything becomes uh less profound and i think it's just a sad part of life um and when we there was an old tv program called top of the pops and We got to do Top of the Pops uh, because we were t- Six Underground was top ten, so we performed Top of the Pops. And I remember being a kid saying, I, "You know, I, if I could ever play Top of the Pops, I'd be so <laughs> blown away. It would be like a dream, you know, it's an absolute dream come true." I, and then remember, remember doing it, uh, coming off stage and being in the very um, the, the fluorescent lit green room and thinking, "Is that it?" <laughs> you know, it's like it's. it's, it's I've, I've done what I've. I've done what I set out to do. I've actually achieved what I dreamt of, and now what do I do? What what what, what happens next? <laughs> uh, so it's it's sometimes a little bit um, dangerous achieving what you want. Uh, it, it challenges it challenges you in different ways. Yeah, it's never it's never quite satisfying <laughs> to achieve what you want because it. It, the reality is never is, is never quite as impressive and well it's fleeting it's gone yeah and you don't get the chance to do that again yeah it, it's a it's one off and it's a one way system yeah it's uh, it's a bit strange i always liked when because i i moved to birmingham uh shortly uh, i think The year before the album came out, so it was finished, uh, and I lived in this big mansion house in Birmingham, which had been converted into flats with 25 other people. The album came out in September or August '96. Yeah, and then Six Underground was a single in early 1997. And all I had at the time for this year was this demo cassette where Six Underground was still just Earth Blues, a dummy lyric version. And the people in the house, they liked it, but they thought I was talking shit about this band. Oh, no, he's full of crap, stupid little northern bastard. And then suddenly this DJ made it his record of the week. And everybody was knocking on my door in the basement, <laughs> just going, wow, your song is on the radio. I said, I've heard the song. It's seven o'clock in the morning. Please leave me alone. But it was on a, it was on a breakfast show. I think. Yeah. <laughs> was... After after that, I, you know, I, 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 I couldn't buy a drink for about three weeks. It was lovely. <laughs> so. If Top of the Pops was the old dream that came true, are there any new dreams you want to fulfill with Sneaker Pimps? We've definitely started talking about the next record. So that will be interesting because it will be entirely new compositions. Uh, we want to keep going. We, we're, we're releasing more singles. We're doing more videos. The live stuff's going to happen. Um, you know, it just feels alive again. And it's been a massive uh, satisfaction to me that that 
you know that that's uh, the old the old band has revived and I think you know it was always on my bucket list to do that and I would have been I'd have been uh, unhappy if I hadn't done it so so it's so yeah so so the I guess future dreams are new records and hopefully new fans expanding expanding to uh, maybe maybe we'll get some get the youth next time <laughs> yes we'll do some uh, trap music some drill yeah i i would just like to see i would just like to see the i would just like to see the songs it was always a big pleasure as someone who's been involved in the lyrics to uh, to go and watch them being performed live i would really like you know i can't wait to see that when it happens you know yeah you'll c- come out to it's probably going to be mainly us gigs uh, just just for practicality i'm not sure i could do that on principle <laughs> <laughs> well it depends who the president is yeah. if it's trump again no i cannot <laughs> <laughs>